You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Health Podcast. I have a, a podcaster named Eliquity, very cool, like liquidy sounding name, Eliquity. Uh, she has a podcast called The Gluten Free Podcast. Sounds healthier than probably a lot of podcasts you might run into. And uh, Eliquity, thanks for coming. Hey, Richard, thanks for having me on your show today. Yeah, um, I know we talked about this offline, but you know, your name sounds interesting. It's like an onomatopoeia name. Maybe just a quick uh, background of where the name came from. Yeah, so I actually, um, uh, when I was very long time ago, um, when I had my first email, I had I was thinking of um, a really cool name that sounded exotic and feminine, and I wanted to um, incorporate my grandmother's first name, which was Elizabeth. So I took the first three letters of her name, and I just kind of made up the rest. And it probably took me about five minutes. I'm pretty good at coming up with ideas. And um, later on in life, I had a life coach who said I should market that. So when I decided to do my podcast, I decided to take my handle and make it my name. So that's how I came up with Eliquity. That makes sense. It would be funny if, if actually your last name was uh, it was Jones, like Eliquity Jones. Or if you want to really get crazy, you could say your last name is Anamanapia, and people would like lose their mind to it. <laughs> That would be like mind blowing. That would be on a monopoly. It would be funny if anybody had to spell, spell that it? one right the first the first time, right? Yeah, like under pressure. I don't think anyone would in the spur of the moment if you were looking at them, they would never be able to spell it. They would like lose their mind and freak out. Maybe like the kid who won this national spelling bee last year could spell it, but that would probably be it. Right, exactly. That's it. You know. <laughs> right. We'll have to find so, that well, little kid and see and test them out. Yeah, yeah that would be cool. So what um your podcast also has an unusual name, the Gluten Free Podcast. I mean, what, it probably sounds obvious why I named that, but uh, what, what's the story of it? So, so my podcast is called Travel Gluten Free Podcast, um, and there's probably about six or seven of us three podcasting um, who are current. So, because there's some older ones that kind of that pod faded a while back. But um, so I make Travel Gluten Free Podcast as I. Um, found out I was not able to eat gluten about four or five years ago. And then my younger daughter was diagnosed with celiacs. And then um, I love to travel. And I noticed that when I was at home, it's pretty easy to make gluten-free food at home because you, you have your own kitchen area and it's, and you clean it and you know, it's safe. But like when you're out on the road and especially when you're not in like, so if I'm in my town where I live, which is Park City, Utah, um, I know the places I can go where I can eat safely, but like when I'm outside of Park City and I'm traveling and I do a lot of road tripping um, and different things, it's really hard to find safe food. And that's why I decided to do Travel Gluten Free Podcast because uh, first of all, it's really hard, as I said, to find food. And a lot of people don't know the tools you can use to find safe gluten-free food. So when I first became gluten-free, I went online and then there's like recipes and there's little things here and there, but nobody really tells you how to be gluten. So that's why I started the podcast is because um, that's one of the hardest things about being gluten-free is learning how to do that and what is really dangerous and what foods are more safe. And so, um, and that you basically can't trust any food out there once you get outside your house. So I wanted to do that for people. And um, as I was doing some consumer-facing expos that are gluten-free expos, I talked to a woman and she said she hasn't been traveling in like about five years be just because she's celiac and she doesn't know what to do. So this podcast is specifically for anybody who's celiac or gluten intolerant that, yeah, that need to know what to do when just outside of their own home. Well, yeah, and it's not, from what I've heard, it's not something that you just want to test because the consequences are pretty severe, right? Like what, what happens to people that have celiac or just have 
an unnamed gluten sensitivity and they have gluten, what, what will happen to them? Yeah. So if you have like a gluten sensitivity or gluten intolerance, that just means when you eat gluten, um, it really messes with your stomach and you feel sick. But when you have celiac disease, um, that is an autoimmune disease, which means every time you eat gluten, your body will attack the small intestine. So if you continue to eat gluten and you're celiac, you can end up with very dangerous and deadly cancers, um, such as adenocarcinoma, which is cancer of the small intestine. And that's actually the cancer my dad passed away from, but he was never diagnosed as celiacs because um, back in like the early 90s, nobody was looking for celiacs. And I believe that if he did have the testing today, that they would have found out that he is celiacs. Um, my mom's side of the family doesn't have that, but my dad's my dad had all the symptoms. And so um, you, if you're celiacs, so it's like a range of, um, symptoms, but basically, um, a lot of celiacs, what we experience is when we eat something with gluten in it, um, within an hour, you're basically in the bathroom, just, you're sitting in the bathroom for six hours getting sick. And then you're sick between anywhere between three and six days after that. And it usually takes about a full week to like completely recover and feel better. So it like, if you're if someone who's celiacs, it's an actual disease that if you get gluten in your system, it does make you ill. Like I've missed work from it. Um, and luckily I've never been sick on vacation just because I'm extra careful when I'm on vacation. But yeah, if, even if you get like a little bit, like say someone takes your food and puts it on a prep on a board in a restaurant that had bread on it, that had breadcrumbs on it, that can cross contaminate you enough to make you sick depending on, and some celiacs are more sensitive than others, but it does make you very ill. Uh, and it does make you sick for days. It takes you out for sure. That's crazy. I didn't realize it was that serious. Wow. Huh. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. And obviously you probably wouldn't unless you lived with somebody who was celiac or you were celiac yourself. But yeah, it does. It does take a toll on you for sure. Well, how do people that uh, don't know that they haven't lived? I mean, do they just, do they, I, I would guess they get used to it partially so they don't feel well, but they're not like completely debilitated. Right. Or what's their life? No, you actually, yeah, you actually can get completely debilitated from celiac disease. Um, one of my friends who is also in the gluten-free space, her name is Taylor, Nakar Taylor Nakakihara. Um, she goes under TNAX, T-N-A-K-S, um, on social media. And before she found out she was uh, celiac, she was actually bedridden for two months at the age of, like, 19 because she was so sick she couldn't even get out of bed. And so... Um, yeah, it can, it can, it, because what happens is when it attacks your small intestine, your small intestine is the organ in your body, which absorbs all of your nutrients. So you're basically starving yourself if you are celiac and eating gluten because it kills the, the tissue in your small intestine. So you don't absorb any nutrients at all. So even though you're eating food, it's just basically passing right through you. So you don't get any nutrients and then your body just slowly starves. And that's why one of the symptoms of celiac disease is rapid weight loss without any kind of, like you didn't change your diet, but you're suddenly losing weight. Oh, is there um, research, you know, on, on uh, celiac, why it happens and how it happens, you know, where the autoimmunity stems from or not much? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's several different websites. One of them is celiac.org and um, also the Canadian Celiac Association. Um, and there's other ones as well that fund celiac research. And so far, basically what they found out in a nutshell is that there is an autoimmune and that it's, it, it, you have it like your whole life because I, did, I wasn't celiac, so I was in my early 40s. And so, um, but it will get turned on by certain environmental factors. And um, they don't know all of the environmental factors that turns on the gene. But once the gene is turned on and you have celiacs, it can't be reversed as far as anybody knows. So the only way that you can um, manage celiac disease is through diet. So the good thing about that is you can manage your diet. Um, the bad thing about that is people cheat and um, they don't realize how bad it is when you get adenocarcinoma. I watched my dad basically um, just starve. You basically starve to death for the last three years of your life. So um, that's why I like to get this message out. That, like, if, if you are listening to this and you have celiac disease, please don't cheat. Because even if it doesn't affect you a lot that you see on the outside, it is definitely affecting your insides. And there's a lot of really bad secondary cancers you can get. Um, if you have celiac disease and you're not following your diet. So definitely follow your diet if you have celiac disease. But um, and there's still ongoing research all the time and they're finding out news about celiac disease. Um, but right now, the only treatment they have for it is just, you know, be careful with your diet. So what's, um, I mean, I don't know, what's the solution? You know, just 
just have to be very careful. They have to prepare all their own meals or so, what yeah, they so, do if they have to travel. Or let's start with locally. You know, they're, they're mm-hmm. living in City X. What? How is your life different? How are people's lives different with celiac? What do they have to do? So when I go out to eat at a restaurant, um, what I'll usually do is um, I will use the fine gluten for an app that um, was invented by Jason Elmore a few years ago, and he's also celiac. And um, you can go on that app and you can, it's free, you could just search like near yourself. And there's also another app that's called 100% Gluten Free, um, which is made by, oh my gosh, I can't remember the influencer's name, but it's a great app and it features all restaurants that don't have any gluten in them. They are um, 100% gluten-free restaurants. So that's the first thing I do is I'll go on that app and look and see what's around me because other people who are celiacs or gluten intolerant will rate the restaurant. And then another thing I do is I also look for places that have gluten-free items labeled on their menu because if they have them labeled on their menu, they're more conscious and they probably have trained their employees to some extent. And then the third thing, which I tell everybody to do, is be a huge advocate for yourself. Um, You have to ask your waiter questions, like I'll ask them, which one of these items are gluten-free? Like, do you have a separate space in the kitchen that you prepare them on? If you don't, can you please tell the chef I have a gluten allergy? Because even though celiac disease is not an allergy, a lot of people don't understand celiac disease, but they understand the word allergy. So that's usually what I tell people is I have a gluten allergy and this and gluten makes me sick. So can you wipe down the space and can you tell the chef or whoever's preparing the meal to change their gloves before they make my meal? So all of those things are, they are definitely put a little more stress when you eat out, um, but they, they, they don't completely ensure that you're going to be safe, but they do help you be safe, to be more safe. Um, there was just actually, a, a, in the news, it was really sad. There's an 18-year-old kid who had a dairy allergy and he went to the, a restaurant to eat a burger and he got like a chicken sandwich and he told him he was allergic to dairy. And apparently the chicken was soaked in buttermilk and they still gave it to him anyway, even though he notified the staff of his allergy. And the 18 year old kid went into anaphylactic shock and died from it. And so, and that, that's really sad. And that's a very extreme example, which should not have happened. But um, as we're having celiac disease, it's not a real allergy. So if we do eat it, um, it makes us sick for days, but we, it's not an anaphylactic shock reaction. So, um, so that's one of the main differences too. But um, yeah, so you have to be proactive for yourself. You have to speak up. Um, I've heard some people say they feel guilty because they ask their friends to go to restaurants which they feel are safe. And I, don't, I never feel guilty about that because I'm like, this is my health and it's important to me and my friends will respect that. And so they, yeah. I always tell people like, look, right. Like, look, I'm gluten free. And they're like, okay, you pick the restaurant. And so I picked the restaurant because gluten-free doesn't mean taste-free. It just means I can't have gluten. So there's lots of great restaurants where I live here in Park City that make incredible food that's gluten-free. And then they also make regular food too. Like they make all sorts of breads and things. And so there's lots of great places here that I can eat. And there's some really good places in Salt Lake as well. Okay. So what, what's the reaction of restaurants when you ask them, you know, please clean or wipe again? Or, I mean, do people roll their eyes? And if that happens, do you leave? Or do you, are you gauging the that's reaction a, of the person you're talking to? No, Richard, thank you for asking that question. I, that's a great question. So it depends on the restaurant. A lot of the places that have their menus labeled are, are more understanding. And so when you tell them that, they, or they're like, oh, okay. And they're like, I'll make a note of that. And you'll actually see on your, on your check receipt where it says like gluten allergy. And so those places are more likely to, um, to be like very accommodating. And then there's places where I've gone in and I've asked them and I've told them like, look, I have a gluten allergy. Can they do this? And they're like, well, I'm pretty sure that's gluten free. I'm like, no, you need to check because I tell them, I tell my waiter or waitress, I will be very sick if you don't check. So, um, and if they don't want to check, or if I feel like, like nobody really knows what they're talking about, I will get up and walk out of the restaurant. Um, I think that's happened about two or three times where actually probably more than that, where I looked at the menu where I've talked to the maitre d' and they, they're pretty clueless. And so I won't eat at those places because I just don't feel mm. safe. It's just not worth the risk. Um, so yeah, you are, if you don't feel safe at a restaurant and you can eat gluten, it is perfectly fine to get up and walk out of that restaurant and, and eat somewhere else where you feel safe. Cause it's not worth risking like losing three days of work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I understand. I mean, I would, I mean, even just not having that problem when I go to certain places and I'm talking to the, you know, the clerk or whoever, the waiter or waitress, I, I guess I feel like, you know, you gotta be nice to them. You don't want to piss them off, but right. I don't know. Like what, what if you go to a place and you know, you make the order, you specify everything 
they leave and another waitress comes or someone else brings you food. Like, I, I, I don't know. I just feel like I would be constantly suspicious, unfortunately, if that were the case. Or, yeah. you know, let's say the food's taking a long time. I would think, oh, shit. Now I got to ask the person and I don't want them to be pissed off or forget or I can see they're distracted. <laughs> And I, I mean, this happens to me with, with decaf coffee. Like I had, um, you know, kind of like heart palpitations for a while. So I could only have decaf. Oh. And I was like, really, par- this is why I asked you. So I was like really paranoid about it. Okay. And I'd be like on alert mentally, you know, I'd, mm-hmm. I'd watch the person. And it, I just wonder if you experienced the same thing and what do you do? I, no, I totally do. And so what I do is when, so I'll, I'll tell them all the stuff I send. They bring me, usually it's a server. I look at them and I say, is this gluten-free? And if they can't say absolutely yes, for sure, I say, can you go back and check? And I will not eat that food until it's been verified that my plate's gluten-free. And even that, even then I've been poisoned twice. <laughs> we call it being poisoned once by sushi. Cause I think that the, whoever was the waiter just was lazy and didn't check. And there, the eel sauce had soy sauce in it, which contains wheat. And then the second time I was eating at a restaurant in Salt Lake and he brought me the spread and I said, this is gluten free. And he said, yes. And I took a bite out of it. And I haven't eaten wheat in so long that when I do eat wheat, it, it tastes weird to me now. And I took a bite and I was like, I don't think this is gluten free. So he came back and he double checked and he's like, oh no. He's like, they gave me the wrong plate. That's regular bread. And so, um, so I was sick for a couple of days, but, um, yeah. So even though I do double check when they deliver the food, sometimes even then it still gets messed up. Um, but, but I mean, it's a chance you take every time you eat out and you just have to accept that every once in a while you're going to get sick even with all of the things you put in place. Okay. So what about now the travel aspect? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So when I go out to travel, I'm extremely. I'm just extremely, extremely, I'm way more careful when I go out to travel than when I eat at home. So um, I'm still careful when I eat at home. But like, for instance, the other day I was really craving, but it was a couple of weeks ago, I was really craving French fries. And I ate two French fries off someone else's plate. And I knew they were in a fryer with that was probably with something else with wheat. And those two French fries, the next day I was working out and my legs were just killing me because that's one of the like side effects of cross-contamination is you get really bad pain in your quadricep muscles. Um, which are the major muscles on the top of your legs. And so I was just, I was in pain for a couple of days, but I knew that was going to happen. And that was like my own dumb fault. Um, But um, yeah, I'm just really careful. I do all the precautions I said before. Um, And one of the other things I do is I try to eat at dedicated gluten-free restaurants when I go out on vacation, um, which isn't always possible, but um, I use that, I use that find me gluten-free app a lot because it's international and I also use that 100% gluten-free app as well because those are two tools I always use on the road. And then you can always go on their website and call ahead and check, and I've done that before as well. So that always helps. Um, but, yeah, and one of the great things if you're going to travel, if you're still actually have any type of food allergy, is cruising. And, and um, one of the things I like about cruising is that you can have any type of food allergy, and you can go on a cruise, and they're extremely careful about how they serve it and what they serve you, especially if you're gluten-free. So I've gone on a cruise and they have all these great like gluten-free desserts, like insane desserts. Um, And I'm actually going to put together like a video montage of all the food I got on my last uh, trip that I took to Iceland and Norway. And they're really careful with their food on cruises. So if you're really worried about traveling, I would say definitely try a cruise. Um, I've done Princess, I've done Holland, I've done Norwegian, um, and they're all good princess and they have really really great food on it and um i really like their service as well so every time i've been on a princess cruise uh, i've never gotten cross-contaminated or sick from the food on it so so that's definitely five-star review for princess food <laughs> yeah hmm. what, what about when you go to a country where you know you're not uh i don't know you're not there with the language and i yeah. guess you'd have to make so- sure you look up the words and you know before you go there yeah, so that's one of the things I do. There's these things called um, food cards. Uh, and so you can take a food card that's translated into the other language. Or you can go on, like, Google Translate. And Google Translate's not that great. Um, or another thing you can do if you're going to a foreign country is you can usually find somebody who speaks English and, ha- and write out in English what you want to say to people. And then they can translate it for you on another piece of paper. And then you can type that into your phone or 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 take that piece of paper that they gave you and, and like photocopy it or take a picture of it with your phone and then show it to people as you go to restaurants. So that's another thing you can do if you don't speak the language. Um, and most countries I've been to, 
especially like Norway, Iceland, um, most country, most other countries I've been to in Europe and, and abroad, so there's someone who always speaks English usually, then that's not always the case, but, um, but you can usually find like a really good translator online and then type it in and then have that as a picture on your phone or even take like paper copies of it on your printer and just hand them, give them to people as they go to the back of the kitchen. And that way you can just give them out. And that's another way to kind of double check that you're getting safe food as well. Hmm. What's, um, okay. Are there particular, I mean, I'm not asking to name chains, but <laughs> what's the experience like if you go to a big chain versus a mom and pop place? Is one worse than the other? Yeah, and and that goes back to like it really depends on the chain. Like um, some chains that are really uh, about doing uh, Jimmy John's I've, is good. Um, oh, not so, um, Subway is okay, but um, what was the other one I went? To? It's um, oh my gosh, it's a sub place, and I'm, I'm but it's a it's a major like chain Subway sub or place. Something? Yeah, it's Subway? not Subway. It's another one, and I can't think of the name of it. It's um. Oh my gosh, I know it's on my website somewhere. Anyway, um, okay. there's just certain chain restaurants that are really good um, for for that. And if you are looking for chain restaurants that uh, accommodate allergies, I would definitely say check out Ellen Bain's The Celiac Scene. She has a whole list of like uh, different chain restaurants that are really good at accommodating allergies. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. and some of the mom and pop places are really great. Like I've stopped at mom and pop places like all over the world and they've been just really great about accommodating and I've, I've stopped in other ones and they have been really horrible. <laughs> so it's like, okay. yeah, again, you have to check with them individually for sure. So what are some of the, um, I don't know, what are some things I haven't asked you about or interesting findings from your podcast? Like where, yes. what kind of places has it taken you? So, well, I want to, I want to really quick talk about, cause like we've talked about a lot of the downside of celiacs. One of the, one of the positive sides of celiacs for me, um, is that I like to cook and having celiac disease really got me outside of my box. So now I'm trying all these like new flours like coconut and almonds and teff and, um, and seeing how I can create new things and potato starch and tapioca flour out of other flours I wouldn't normally have used. So it's mm. been a really great learning experience for me and really good experience on like how hard it is to cook without wheat. But um, also like the benefits of eating other different types of flours and getting more taste your taste which is is really good for your body um because and really good for your brain because it gives you a new taste sensation which stimulates different parts of your brain which if you didn't know that that's that's a pretty cool fun fact i learned hmm. um and then what was the i'm sorry what was the second part of your question well uh, yeah i was going to ask you um where what kind of places has the podcast taken you meaning i don't know any interesting unusual people uh things you've learned that really expanded your your world your knowledge like where have you decided to take the podcast and what, what kind of things have you learned? Yeah, so um, I usually actually kind of flip it. I usually go to a place that I want to go and then, right, and then I'll, I'll talk about it on the podcast. So um, mm. here's like a really fun example. So I was in Mexico with, a, with my girlfriend and we were actually on a cruise and it was Cozumel. We were in Cozumel and we were waiting at this market because we were going to do this like race thing, like excursion. And... Um, we were walking around the market and I my friend who's with me sp spoke fluent Spanish and I speak okay Spanish. And so we're walking through the market talking to people and we met this guy who was, uh, no, he was all, he was completely Mayan. And there's actually a picture of him on my website. So if you go to travelgluenfreepodcast.com, he's like actually on the front page on the bottom. And he started talking to us about Mayan culture and Mayan food. And he was talking to us about cactus juice and how healthy it is for you. And they were selling some right there. And um, I'm pretty sure it was made with the, with the local water, but I had a bottle anyway. <laughs> it was actually really good. Right. And um, okay. yeah, and so it just leads me to try new foods that I wouldn't have normally tried because I'm out exploring and, um, and finding out like new places and new people. And it's just, it's really cool talking to locals. That's one of the things you, you, it's hard to get on a cruise because you're on, you're, you're only at a certain space for a very short period of time. That's why I love road tripping because you get to learn, talk to locals and a great way to talk to locals or to get to talk to somebody locally is if you go into a restaurant and you eat at the bar and I'm not a big drinker. Mm -hmm. Like I might have maybe four glasses of wine in a month, but um, I noticed that when I sit at a bar, you usually sing at a bar with other people who are by themselves. And so I met a lot of really cool and itchy people that are local and not local um, just sitting down at bars and eating dinner. Like when I go out to road trip or I'm on vacation. So that's another cool way to meet interesting people. But yeah. Um, my, my podcast is, has um, kind of followed me around the world, and, and that's the fun thing is I just kind of get to pick where I want to go. And since the world is a huge place, I 
we'll probably never run out of content. <laughs> yeah, that's so. great. Have you noticed that there are, are there are a lot of uh, celiac people in other countries, or is it more? Uh... I don't know. The, is it focused in the U.S.? Like, what, what have you noticed? Yeah. So, interestingly enough, the 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 country that has the most celiacs per capita is Italy. As you know, Italian because I was from a big Italian family, so we ate, always ate a lot of bread and pasta that's wheat based. And so, and if you want like really safe gluten free food, the best place to go is Italy, which is which when you think about it, it seems like that doesn't seem to make sense. But the reason that is, is because there's the most people per capita who is, who are celiacs is in Italy. And so um, Italy is a really great safe place to eat. Um, um, what else? Um, London, I found some really great gluten-free um, fried onion rings. Mau Maui was a really great place to eat gluten-free food. Um, they had a really mm -hmm. great selection there. So, um, yeah, and you find it in the, in the strangest places. Apparently, I haven't been to Ireland yet. That's on my hit list. But a lot of people tell me Ireland is, oh, has a, a lot place. of great, yeah, gluten-free foods, especially at the local pubs. So I'm really stoked to hit Ireland and hit the pubs and check it out. Yeah, were there any uh, countries or cultures where it's like you know, a no-brainer to eat uh, gluten-free? Um, besides Italy, I would say like Ireland, London, London, because London has such a variety of food. Um, d depending on the U.S. where you're at, a lot of the major cities have really great gluten-free food. Like um, Chicago is really great gluten-free. Philadelphia is great. Austin, Texas is great for gluten-free. Um, and pretty much any uh, anywhere in California is has great gluten-free food. Um, Tillamook in Oregon, I found some great gluten-free food. Um, Seattle has good gluten-free. So a lot of the big cities will have really good gluten-free food um, in the United States as well. Um, Iceland was kind of hard to find gluten-free. Um, you could find it, but it was kind of here or there. Uh, luckily, a lot of people in Iceland and Norway when I visited this summer spoke English and um, and their local language. So it was pretty easy to talk to people to find out, uh, to kind of navigate the menu. Um, but some places that you don't want to go if you're gluten-free, um, which is really hard to eat, is Paris. Because Paris is like, what? You don't want to eat wheat? What's wrong with you? Like, I, I actually had a, I showed a meter D my card, my food card. And he looked at me like, meat? Yeah, you can't oh, eat wheat, here. Wheat. Everything is unsafe. Wheat. Mm. Yeah, wheat. So, what so you, Paris um, is very hard. Is there, is there a possibility to make it like a little dictionary or a card that says, uh, you know, I, I have celiac or I can't eat gluten, like in the 100 or 200 languages? You know, it wouldn't be a full dictionary, but it might be a really cool traveler's card that you could sell or give to people that have, you know, uh, celiac problems. Yeah. And actually that's one of my things on my checklist to do is to create those. Um, because I just, I just came out with a book recently. It's called the guide to traveling gluten-free and you can find it on Amazon. Um, and even oh. if you're not celiac, if, yeah, if you just have food allergies, it's a great, it's a great, um, guide to use. It's like 20 pages, um, to figure out like, um, what to do if you have a food allergy and you're out and about traveling. And um, I'm going to be following it up with a book soon. But one of the things I'm going to offer um, with my book is the, to get like a free set of restaurant cards. So that's one of the things mm -hmm. that is on my hit list to work on for sure. So, yeah. Very cool. You could actually, I don't know if there's a symbol for people that have celiac or food allergies, but I mean, you could create, you know, just like your name, it's, it's unique. You could create a symbol. And if you build enough of a community, that would become the symbol for, you know, for celiac or food allergies. And restaurants yeah. might, you know, you might partner with them in some way. And then they, when they see that, they go, oh, yeah, okay, we know right away. Right. Yeah, there's no, in the United States, there's no common, like, a lot of times you'll see the GF with the, like, the circle through it. Or you'll see, like, the wheat, like, a little picture of wheat with the circle with a line through it. And I actually have a little, like, with a line through it on my um, podcast cover. But um, actually, in Europe, they have a whole codex of food allergies. So it's. Um, and it says like G. So if it says G next to the um, the menu item, then you know that it has gluten in it. If it says S, it's soy. So there's a whole codex in Europe that is common throughout all of Europe that you can use um, when if you have any type of food allergy, and you can see what types of allergens are in each food. So that was really useful when I was over in Europe because I could clearly see what had gluten in it. And it was funny because we were at this one restaurant, and there's a bunch of G's, and my husband thought G meant gluten free. And he's like, oh, look at all these choices you have at this restaurant to eat. I'm like, no, honey, that means I, I can't eat because it says G. <laughs> so because in America, they put, they'll usually put a G means it's gluten-free or GF means it's gluten-free. But in Europe, if you see the G, that means it has gluten in it. So you have to be really careful when you read the menus. But yeah, that was, that was kind of funny. Mm. You know, it's funny. And uh, I'm in Austin, Texas. 
and they had this um, food fair, and there was a company called GF Yourself Kitchen, and I took a picture of it, and oh. I went up to the guy, and I said, you know, I, I think you're going to push people away by saying GF Yourself, like, go go fuck yourself, you know, he goes, no, 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 it's uh-huh. gluten-free yourself, I said, well, I understand, but your name, you know, GF Yourself, I'm from New York, GF Yourself, you know what it's saying, so. <laughs> So right, really I'm from Philly. So I, don't yeah. know if he was, I don't know if he was successful with that. Well, you know what? It's funny when you said that. I immediately thought gluten free because, like, in the when you're when you're gluten free, when you see GF, it's like an immediate response that is gluten free. So that's probably. But I understand what you mean because I'm from South Philly originally, and so yeah, GF yourself is not a good like yeah, that's not a good little term to have if you want to stay alive in South Philly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> But hey, if you are in Austin, I'm going to tell you, if you're in Austin and you're looking for gluten-free, uh, Max's Wine Dive it has the best and the only gluten-free fried chicken I've ever found. And, oh. and that gluten-free fried chicken plate is like insanely amazing. What's it called again? It's called Max's Wine Dive. And it's right downtown. I can't remember what street it's on. But if you look okay. up Max's Wine Dive, you'll see they have a really great wine list and they have like, insane breed fried chicken and you can eat it even if you're celiac and it's really good. So if you're in Austin, definitely check out that. And there's also an Indian place that has excellent Indian food. It's called um, the Garage, like the, oh, the Taj, I think it's like called the Taj Garage. And it's actually oh. in an old garage and it's Indian food in Austin that's also really great. And it's not downtown, it's in that college area. And I can't think of the name of the area right now, but um, the gr- oh, it's called the yeah. Garage Mahal. The Garage Mahal. So definitely check out Garage that's Mahal hilarious. in Austin. That's hilarious. Oh, is that garage where you live? Mahal. Yeah, I'm in Austin yeah. now, yeah. But the, the, I was just going to say the Garage Mahal, but they, that's the name already. That's cool. Yeah, that's, cool. that's a really great Indian place. Well, just a, a couple questions left. Um, what, I mean, this may be obvious, but for people that don't know, what kind of foods tend to, to contain gluten that are unexpected? You know, maybe a couple oh. of ones that are obvious and then a couple yeah. that are not obvious that can get people in trouble. Okay, that's an awesome question. So I'll go with the not the obvious ones are obviously like breads, pasta, um, tabbouleh is wheat based as well. So any bread pastas and tabbouleh and anything that says wheat in it is obviously um, uh, has gluten. Barley, so a lot of beers um, um, made without gluten, uh, they have gluten in them as well. But some unexpected things that people don't know about, especially people who don't live with members who are celiac or they don't have a gluten intolerance themselves are like soy sauce because soy sauce in America is made with wheat in Japan it's not so if you're in America you have to ask for gluten-free soy sauce right and so um, Mm. also a lot of salad dressings grade soups are made with wheat because wheat is used as a thickener Um, so you have to you have to double check to see if those things uh, are gluten-free Pretty much anything, like I've eaten rotisserie chicken and it had maltodextrin on it and maltodextrin can be made from wheat and it made me sick. Um, I was eating right. peanuts one time and the peanuts made me sick because they had maltodextrin. So um, maltodextrin, monosodium glutam- glutamate or MSG also contains gluten. So those are two things that a lot of people don't know. Um, you can also find gluten in your cosmetics and in your toothpaste um, because again, it's used as a thickener. So uh, because wheat is used as a thickener or a filler, it's in a lot of things like truffles. There's a lot of truffles that have wheat in the filling. So when I eat candy out, I don't have an allergen list. I won't eat truffles because they can put wheat in as a filler. And what it does is it it extends the filling so that the filling is cheaper. And so they can charge the same amount for the candy but make more profit because they can use wheat as a filler to extend like the really expensive ingredients inside the truffle. So that's another that's place terrible. you wouldn't expect to find it. Ice cream, yeah, ice cream, even though it's not like a cookie ice cream, because wheat is used as a filler in ice cream as well. So you have to check that your ice cream is also gluten free, even if it's just plain vanilla. <laughs> so there's a lot of things to look for that you wouldn't expect to find gluten in unexpected places. Yeah, that's crazy. Wow. I know. It's got, I call it like I mean, navigating the minefield when I get a menu that I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure about this one. You have to ask how everything's prepared and, and all that, right? Yeah, and there's and there's definitely some ethnicities that are are gluten free friendly. Like Indian food doesn't use a lot of gluten. Um, a lot, some seafood places, depending on what they are, they won't use a lot of gluten. Um, what else? Um, Thai food, Nepalese food is is definitely gluten free friendly. Um, some that you have to watch out for is Chinese food, especially if the uh, or Asian food in general, because they use a lot of soy sauce 
And you have to be really mm. careful with sushi because some fish are soaked in soy sauce beforehand. And so even though it just says fish, it might be soaked in soy sauce beforehand. So you have to know really? um, if that, yeah, if that has gluten in it or not. Um, and then again, mm. like with the eel sauce that I used earlier, some places when they do make their eel sauce, they make it with regular soy sauce. And some places make eel sauce with gluten-free soy sauce. So you have to ask them if they use soy sauce in their <laughs> It's crazy. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. But once you get to know like the places that you can eat at safely, I tend to frequent those. And then everybody who's coming with me also frequents those places. And then they find new places that they like to eat as well. So if you're a restaurant and you're listening to this, um, you definitely want to make your place gluten-free friendly because the person with celiac disease is usually deciding where they're going to eat and they're taking their family and their friends with them. I know I take all my business clients with me to gluten-free places mm. or places are gluten-free friendly. And it's great food, and we usually go back there for lunch like two or three times a year at least. So it makes a lot of sense. Definitely, yeah. yeah, there's definitely money to be made when you can accommodate people. Yeah, I've gotten uh, you know, I mean, it turns into a personal thing, but you know, probably apply to other people. I, I don't think I have a, a celiac problem, but I, I've gotten allergies from certain foods, which didn't really make sense to me. Like sushi, in a lot of places, there's only a few I can go because I get allergies from it. Odd, and I think that's what's going on. Is they're using, like you said, you know, soy sauce and the fish or everything, mm -hmm. um, and that's what's doing it. I'm getting the feeling that that's what's happening. So maybe that's that's the deal. I don't know. Yeah, and there there is like a test that you can get, and I, I can't remember the company, but basically you send in like your a, a sample of your hair, and it doesn't have to be a big sample, and then they take it and they test you for like food intolerances. So one of the common things with celiacs is you're intolerant to dairy. Um, but I found what I found that I can eat the dairy in Europe and Iceland. The dairy is really good. Um, I actually drank chocolate milk in Iceland and I haven't drank chocolate milk like straight out of a carton in five or six years. And it was amazing. <laughs> um, I'm sure, because I'm sure. it's the, it's the way we process our food here in America and which is the way we process it. It isn't good. And so I can't eat the dairy and it's like imported dairy. Um, but I, I can eat the dairy in Europe and Iceland perfectly fine and it doesn't bother me. So yeah, it just, it depends on where you're at and what you're eating. Yeah. We went on a family trip to Europe, you know, this year and it, it was just a totally different experience. Like all of us felt a lot less inflamed and, you know, we all lost a bunch of weight being there. And I thought, man, you know, like I wouldn't want to have to leave the U S for instance, just to have good food, but I don't right? know. I mean, it's, you know, and, and, you know, like there's this big common consensus from, I heard from a lot of people, the food in Europe is just different and it doesn't cause people the reactions it causes here. So I guess, you know, why it's, it's the, uh, it's the way they process it. And probably a lot of it is linked to this. Oh yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of our Americans to autoimmune is like, I don't have any obviously hard proof of that, but we definitely mm -hmm. have way more autoimmune in America than they do over in Europe. And so I think, that's definitely a factor for sure. But yeah, the way we process our food in America is is not is not good for people. And people say like, oh, well, we can adapt to it. But I mean, it, you can, your body can adapt to stuff like that, but it takes like many generations to do that. Like you're not gonna, your body is not gonna adapt to quickly changing process like in your lifetime. So you have to be really careful about what you put in your body and it definitely affects your health for sure. Why would you want to adapt to that? <laughs> right? <laughs> That is a really That's good horrible, point. Yeah. I need to say that the next time someone tells me that. Yeah, yeah why would you, like, why oh, would you want your body to adapt to really bad food, right? Like, that's, it's just not good poisonous, for you. but you'll get used to it. <laughs> it's just a little poison. Yeah, a little poison every day. You'll get used to it. You'll adapt to it. You know? Oh, yeah, sounds great. I, I can't wait to, uh, I, I look forward to adapting to it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's awesome. But yeah, no, that's. Well, very good. No, well, if you haven't been. Uh, Okay. No, I was oh, saying if you haven't been to Europe to try the food there, you definitely need to try the European dairy and Iceland. And Icelandic dairy is the best. It's like heaven yeah, in the had curtain. The skier, the skier yogurt I really liked. That was like awesome. And yeah, I was in Iceland, you know, a, a while ago, but it was a really great place. Friendly, delicious food and everything. Yeah. And again, oh, it just yeah, the... feels different. Like, you know, you can't describe it, but it just, you could just tell the food's mm -hmm. different. You feel different, you know, it's weird. Yeah, skier yogurt is awesome. I love it. And there's also some other products in it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I could eat dairy like three times a day in Iceland and it didn't bother me at all. Where if I did that here, I would be sick all day. Yeah. So yeah, the yeah. Icelandic dairy is just amazing. And they have, and, and if you're a sheep, it's like the best place to live is Iceland for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. 
Well, Liquidy, it's been really good to talk to you. What, so how can people engage with you? Like your podcast, I'm sure, is on all the major channels. And like, what are some ways people can reach out if they have questions or, you know, want to talk to you, have you as a guest, et cetera? Yeah, no, I would love to be a guest if you have a podcast or um, if you are somebody who is needing celiac information or you just have a couple questions. Um, I, I, I have started doing um, Q&A podcasts. So if you have a question, you can send it to me and I could answer it for you right away or I can make a whole podcast on it for you. And the two best ways to get a hold of me um, is on Instagram at Travel Gluten Free Podcast or you can also get a hold of me through my contact form on travelglutenfreepodcast.com. Com. A podcast can be found on all the major players. It's on Overcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. It's on like 15 different players. So if you have a player, you're probably going to find Travel Gluten Free Podcast. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. Well, Alicia, thank you for coming. It's been really good to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate the really thoughtful questions. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.